everyone, Eric Grotebois. So I'm gonna do a deeper dive on a video I just did, a one minute, talking about as an employer, what happens when you get sued for a Fair Labor Standards Act minimum wage and overtime case. So real quick, here's the fact pattern. And actually I'll give you the fact pattern from my perspective. So I'm on the board of this organization and a colleague of mine who works at another law firm gets a notification every single day for all of the labor and employment lawsuits filed in the Southern District of Florida. And he just gets a report, right? It's just a simple report, it's an email. And he sees the organization and he reaches out to me. He's like, hey, Eric, you're on the board. Just a heads up, you guys just got sued. Now it's so soon that the, the organization hasn't even been served yet. So technically none of the deadlines have even started and none of the, the time frame. Normally when you get sued, you have 21 days to answer the complaint. That hasn't even started. And so in this case, the, the lawsuit's been filed. My friend sees it literally on the same day it's filed. He gives me the heads up. I go onto the federal docket. It's called Pacer and I can pull all the things. I, I run it by my partner. My partner's like, yeah, I know that lawyer. He's a solo practitioner who does plaintiff work. Um, and what that means is he generally is gonna be representing the worker suing the company that they used to work for. And here's the normal fact pattern. The normal fact pattern is you have a worker, the worker's working, is a W-2 worker. Now, we've had the misclassification where you're incorrectly treating them as a 1099, and then what the, the fact pattern is the same either way. At some point, you terminate their employment because they're doing a bad job, because they're making mistakes, because there's no, no more work for them, or whatever it is. In this particular circumstance, uh, he was fired for cause. He kept making mistakes um, that were within like the realm of things he was supposed to be doing right. He kept doing them wrong. They had meetings, they did it the right way. They sat down with him, they set expectations. They said, hey, you need to stop making these mistakes. He continued to make the mistakes and so he was terminated for cause. Well, lo and behold, he goes and talks to a lawyer. The lawyer's like, well, hey, let's sue for minimum wage. So here's the way it works. And this is cold, hard truth. The burden is 100%, not 80%, not 50%, it's 100% on the employer to disprove the allegation of unpaid overtime. And the only way you can do that is with time records and pay records. And obviously those are normally in the possession and control of the company, right? So it's the company's obligation. Um, here's a fact pattern, not for this current situation, but I've seen it in the past, where they say to the person who's running the front desk, they say, hey, we're just gonna pay you a fixed amount, don't work overtime, right? So we all agree that you're not gonna work more than 40 hours, I'm just gonna pay you the same amount, that way we don't have to have time records, I don't have to have a time clock, those things are expensive, and we'll just agree, don't work more than 40 hours and I'll pay you the same amount every two weeks. And sure enough, you fire that person because they're doing a bad job, and then they go talk to one of these lawyers and the lawyer's like, well, hey, let's sue for overtime because guess what? They didn't even have time records because you agreed that you weren't gonna have time records. So now they come back and they lie and they say, oh, I worked 60 hours every week and they never paid me those 20 extra hours at time and a half. And that, that ha I've seen it so many times. And unfortunately, the employer's caught flat-footed because the employer doesn't have time records. They can't disprove the allegation. And so a lot of times the conversation that I have with the, with the employer or the former employer is this is extortion, they're lying, this is blood money, I don't wanna pay them a dollar. And so then I have the following conversation with them. I'm like, okay, you can pay me $100,000 to defend you over the next 18 months and we can win, but you'll never get that $100,000 back because the law does not have an attorney's fee clause to recover damages for the employer but the law does have an attorney's fee clause for the employee. So if you pay me a hundred and heaven forbid we lose, then you're gonna have to pay the hundred for the employee's attorney and the $20,000 that they're claiming in unpaid overtime. And so your worst day is you pay 220,000, hundred to me, hundred to them, and 20 in damages to lose. Your best day is you pay a hundred to me and we win, or we can probably settle today for 12. And you're like, well, that 12 is extortion. It's, a, it's based on a lie, it's not fair. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm just doing cold hard math. Cold hard math is I can get you out of it today for 12 of blood money. You can pay me righteous money of 100 and we can win hopefully. Or you can pay me, pay the other guy and pay the other person if we lose for 220. So I know it's bad. Um, a lot of times the only, the only circumstance where the client is like, hey, Eric, I wanna pay you to win is where we need to draw a line in the sand and we need to let people know, 
we're not going to let people take advantage of us. We're not going to let people bully us. And if I'm giving you any advice as an employer, you need to have good records. You need to make sure you're meeting with the labor and employment attorney before you make the mistake of paying the fixed amount to the receptionist. Um, and even then have good records because you are on the hook no matter what. So if you have any questions, leave a comment below. If you're an employer, you need to have a lawyer. If you're an employee, you know, you should know your rights also. Thanks guys.